If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. Tonight's guest was featured on episode 411, and on that show he told us about several dogman encounters he's had on his farm in Cheshire, England. The experiences he told us about on that show just scratched the surface, so he's come back to share more of his experiences with you. Of course, I'm talking about David Bunt. Dave, welcome back. Hi, Vic. Thanks so much for coming back, Dave. If you only had an idea how many people have been contacting me, begging me to get you to come back, they're going to be doing backflips now that you are. Good stuff. Yeah, they're going to be really happy. Like I told you, though, I'm just so sorry to hear that you had to go through these experiences. Yes, I understand, yeah. I did enjoy some of them, though, which weirdly enough is all. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's hard to believe. <laughs> that's really hard to believe, but no, I believe if you say so. Yeah. For any of the listeners who missed episode 411, Dave, please give them the rundown on what you shared with us in that show. If I'm going back, because what I want to talk to you about was after the farm incident. Now, I've seen a female dog man outside stalking me from the farm for I don't know how long. I was in a mess after that. So I moved out the farm the day when, when I come back after seeing it. I went to my dad's for 24 hours. I came back and all the chickens had been slaughtered. It was the right mess. Chickens all over the wall, like they'd been smashed up against the wall and all that. So I moved back to my parents' house on that day. I was out all the time, and I'm not joking. It just doesn't matter how I felt. The worse I felt, the more I, I would go out in the outdoors. I wasn't really an indoor person. So I've gone to my dad, and I was confined to the other small place. They live not too far away from this, about 20 minutes' drive from the farm. So um, I'd gone to my dad's. Now, I'd lost my job not too long after this through having time off because I wasn't willing to go out. It was a shame. I had to spent about two months solid. I didn't go out at all, and it was crucifying me because, I, like I keep saying, I'm a big outdoors person. And all of a sudden, I've had all this like whipped out of my life in the worst way. During this period at my parents' house, I'm used to my own company. I'd spent it trying to study, and I'd come across your episodes and uh, all of the different types of avenues I could on what I'd seen. Now, I knew what I'd seen. The only word where they had was werewolf, but there's other terms that started to pop into me. It was crucifying me. Yeah, I was feeling really poorly, too much time indoors. And soon as dark started to come, because my mum and dad live in a rural village. Now, I'm, I've got so many thoughts going on with my mind. Where do we take this now? Because all I want to do is warn people. But at the same time, I didn't know how. It's like my dad, he's a big hiker. His bikes, his electric bikes, and he's off out all the time. And I wanted to tell him, don't go here, don't go there. Because as far as I was concerned, if that one thing were in Winsford, there's got to be more of them. Also, I must get that in. I had no knowledge on this but at this point, no knowledge on the subject, didn't know the, what the word cryptid meant. I had no idea of anything of the subject. I had to sort of gain this. So over the, th it's got to about three months now. And I'm itching to go out. I need to go out. My me, me best friend, who I didn't mention in the last episode, Danny Gresty, he's like a brother of mine. He's my right-hand man in this. He does his own thing where he lives. He's got God knows how much going on activity. I mean, fingers crossed I could get him talk to you one day. He's quite a quiet lad, Danny is. But Danny has no clue. He's also my camping partner. He's like, wherever I go, he's with me. And so I've not told Danny that about anything. All I said was I was in a mess. He came to see me a few times on the farm to visit me on the build up to this. But up to this point, I've kept it to myself. So that's the three month marks coming. I remember it's being specifically three months to the day when I seen that female dog man. It was coming up to a weekend and Danny was really getting on my back about go getting out. And um, he's always looking out for me and he knew something was up with me and he's trying to get me sort of motivation back. And I thought about it and I thought, if I carry on going, I'm going to make such a hole for myself. I'm never going to go out again. And I know it's only 20 minutes away. Now, where me and Danny wanted to go camping was where we've been before. 
you're not meant to go into this woods for some reason. People don't like you going in there. They have um, the type of security that goes around and they pull you straight off because there's lakes on there. You, people get caught fishing. It's very private. And in fact, now they've fenced it all off so people can't get in for some reason. But I'll get to that in a bit. It's come to the point where I gave in and I said to Danny, I said, do you know what? I will come. I chanced it. I was going to chance it. I didn't know what I was going to be like. I felt a lot better than I've been, but I needed to be outside. So I said to myself, I'm going to start introducing going out camping back into my life bit by bit. Because like I said, Cheshire is full of countryside. If I can't go out, going out on my bike, or if I can't go out with the friends, go for our walks and stuff, I'm knackered. So I decided to introduce it from this day on said to myself, I am going to put a bit of effort in now and to get in. So I've got thousands of pounds worth of camping equipment as well and needed to get out there. So this day was a Saturday. So Danny lives in Winsford. He also lives not too far away from the farm that I lived on. So um, we've arranged to meet at the Nunsmere, it's called. It's about, say... Um, it's in between me dad's and the farm roughly so say 10 miles away i'd say if that so i've met danny out with all the camping equipment and we've got a lot to carry so we've got to walk around a big lake and then there's a massive woods and we, we weren't particularly sure where we were going to camp and it was saturday it was daytime it was quite cold as well so we've made a way we said see you to me dad my dad knows roughly where we are my dad's the only person me and Danny liked to keep where we were going anonymous. We never liked to tell anyone because we didn't want anybody turning up and ruining it. No offence to friends and that, but it could happen if, it, if too many people know where you're going. So we like to keep it a bit secret and we always let someone know where we are in case of emergencies. And now that's me dad on this case. So we've got to Nunsmere. We've made our way through. Now, about half, we've got a lot of luggage, so half an hour's gone and we've drifted off into part of the woods that we haven't gone. And we seem to be circling ourselves and ending up back at the same place. And time's ticking on. So I've said to Danny, I've said, look, I said, let's just plonk a stuff here. And I have a short look and then we'll pick the best of what we've got and then we'll get set up. So there's a massive lake at Nunsmere. It's ancient, it is. It's got quite a bit of history and that to it. So we weren't too far away from that. Now I've plonked my stuff. And I wasn't too well. I should have added this at the beginning. I wasn't too well. I had a bad stomach. I was in knots. I mean, I'd gone through so many emotional ups and downs. There was something up with my stomach that was really hurting me. I can't explain the pain that I was suffering at this time. So it was putting me off doing anything. But I've gone. And it slowly started to ruin my day, this stomach pain that I was getting. So I said to Danny, I said, I'm going to plonk my stuff here. And I was plonked next to a bush. And there's a quite a scary bit, which I'll tell you about in a minute, about this bush. So there's a massive bush next to me. Danny's about 10 yards to me right. And we've got a massive lake in front of us. And uh, it's pretty cold. And we set the tent up. We've got all the stuff together. And we didn't bring any firewood. Um, we forgot the firewood. But I was in a lot of stomach pain. Now, I haven't told Danny anything about the farm. Danny is oblivious of the subject on cryptids. He doesn't have a clue. He wouldn't have been interested if I'd told him. I haven't told a soul. I've harboured this all this time, and it shows the way I am. My personality's changed a bit. I'm still really nervous, and I'm out for the first time. I had no idea how nighttime was going to be. We haven't got a location where we could tell anyone we were I'm not to mention that the signals on our phones were absolutely terrible. So all these warning signs that you get when you get into your camping, you know, you make sure none of these are part of your camping night after they've failed you once. So and we've camped up. I'm, all I want to do is get in my sleeping bag and I've got stomach ache. And so I'm in my tent for most of the evening. And then it starts getting a bit darker and Danny's collecting firewood and this wood that he was collecting was burning quickly. And I'm not contributing. Now, it must have been about 10 p.m. And Danny, the day's gone so quick. I was just sat in my tent. I was. I was just not feeling the vibe. I was rarely getting out of my tent because I didn't want to, as it was getting darker, I just thought if I stay in my tent, I won't unnerve myself. 
So Danny was about 20, 30 yards away. Bless him, he was collecting wood all night. Now, I've not noticed, but he must have been a bit irritated. Now, I'm not well, by the way, in the tent, so I've popped my head out to have a look at him, and he looked quite annoyed that I wasn't contributing to collecting wood. So I've gone back in the tent, and I thought, oh, I just didn't want to get out because it was dark now. The moon was shining through, so I've left him to it. So as time's gone on, so it must have got it's before midnight, say roughly um, roughly around 11 o'clock, I've got out of the tent again. I've hardly communicated with Danny. All we did was listen to some music and have the odd talk like we do, but I wasn't really getting involved. So I've got out my tent now. I've noticed Danny was concentrating on, we've got a bush line behind us about 20, 30 yards away, right, of a group of trees. I wasn't feeling no vibe, nothing. I wasn't getting no bad feelings, nothing at all. But Danny looked like something, his, his whole his demeanour, the way he was, because then half an hour before that, he really looked annoyed, and I knew it's because I wasn't helping him with the firewood. Not in a bad way, he's a, he's a good lad, but he, he was getting frustrated, and he kept trying to motivate me. And I was, didn't have it in me. So I've got a ten. I've looked at him and he look, he's concentrating and, I, and he's shining his lights on this bush line that was just behind us. So I've got out and I've walked over slowly to him and I could tell as I got closer to him, the look on his face, I've seen that with me. And I knew he was seeing something. All me inside just started to clench up. And I just thought maybe I've made a massive mistake because I started to get a horrible feeling around me again. And I don't know whether it was me bringing it on or the nerves kicking in, but I felt exactly like the build-up towards when I seen the last dog, man. It was like a weird feeling in the atmosphere. And then I've noticed there's no noise in the woods at all, no birds. We're by a lake. There's no birds in the lake, nothing, complete silent. And when I say silent, it's not your normal silent. It's a peculiar silent. I can't explain it. So I've gone over, walked over slowly to Danny. Danny's obviously spotted something in the trees. So I've said to Danny, and as soon as he turned around to speak to me, he was stuttering and everything, couldn't get his words out, and my heart sunk. I already knew what he was going to say before he said it. He said, I've seen something in the trees over there. And so I said, what did you see, Danny? He said, just tell me, what, describe what you've seen. And he started laughing as if I wasn't going to believe him. So I, and I've I've started to look over. I wasn't going to shine my torch over. I'm not interested at this point. Danny's saying just over there, at the bottom left side of the bush. He and he starts laughing. He said, "I've seen a massive dog." He said, and it's been staring at me for ages. I says, "How long has it been looking at you?" He said, "It's been looking at me now for over an hour." I said, "Why didn't you come and tell me?" Now I could. I've been choking now. I, I I'm all my all my. I, I wasn't. My body wasn't willing to operate it's like it's slow slow fear just started to hit me so i said why didn't you tell me he says oh he said i just left you to it he said i didn't think you were feeling very well well so i wasn't i said yeah but you should have come and told me and he goes you know what the funny thing is dave he goes it's not took its eyes off me he says and uh it's been about an hour now so i'm saying i'm saying all right so we'll come over to the tent now i i got danny to come over and he's looking over his shoulder so i said go on what's it look like he said, and he's black as the ace of spades. And he said, and it was on its floor. He said, I'm not joking. And this is his words. He said, the head was massive, Dave. He says, but what he couldn't understand is how it's pinned itself to the floor so flat. He said, I'm not joking. He said, you cannot work. I couldn't work it out. He says, that's what was confusing me. He says, whatever it was, was massive. But he said, it's flat to the floor. He said, and it just looked like it had flattened itself to the floor like a piece of paper. It's just the way he described it. And I knew then, I knew then from stuff that I've read, that some animals can do that when they're getting close to things, stalking. They can flatten themselves. This is all stuff I'd watched and read on the build-up to going out now. Now, all this stuff's racing through in my mind. Now, everything's come back to me. So I've said to Danny, I've said, I'm going to have to go have a look. I said, we take me over. Now, this bush line's behind us 20 to 30 yards away. We're... There's not a noise. It's so eerie. Now I've noticed it. It won't. It, it it just won't leave us alone. It's weird. It is. It's like it's so in your face. The silence that, that something's not right. Everything else has decided to be quiet and go away, apart from us. If that's not a warning sign, I don't know what is. 
so we've gone we've gone over slowly and he's shining the torch and he says it's not there it's not there he said it was right there so i'm shining i've got my torch i'm shining along all the, all the trees looking i didn't really want to but um i said to danny i says i can't see nothing either he says it was there dave just there so i've tried to calm him down because he was getting a bit irritated with it because he said he must have had the impression before that um i don't believe him or something and i do believe him so he's pointing down at this bottom of this bush i couldn't see a thing couldn't see nothing i felt horrible i felt eerie so i said to danny I says well I'll tell you what because it was getting cold i says why don't we just go back to the tents i said let the fire die out because we often go camping when it's cold and rainy and just chill out so i said we'll call it one of them nights because we did have fishing rods with us so i said to him i wasn't feeling i just wanted him to get in the tent because Danny's a roamer. Danny will roam off into the woods on his own. He's unfazed. Even with the things that he's witnessed and seen, he'll go off. He's more of a communicator, Danny is. I'm, I'm more common sense side of things. He's more of a communicator, more curious with things. So he will wander and he won't take any, don't go without me type of thing. He'll just go off. So I just wanted him to settle and you know, get into his tent and he, he'll often go sleep before me because I'm usually up quite a lot. But bear in mind, he hasn't got an inkling of what I'm harboring. So we've got in the tents. Now I've got a flap at the back of my tent and I've lifted it up and I've got in my tent. Danny's got in his tent and we're talking to each other. And he just says, I can't understand. He says, it was just staring at me. He said, it wasn't moving. It said I could see its eyes. He said, and it was, it was just gawping at me. Dave, he said, it was freaking me out. He said, and I didn't want to get you out the tent. He says, but he said, I couldn't take my eyes off it. He said, it was just staring straight through me. And I had my heart sunk. So I didn't know what to say to him. So I mean, it must have been approaching midnight now. And Danny's settled down a bit. And um, we put some stories on, on the phone as we do. And he's gone. He's, I could hear him sort of um, getting into a sleep. I was relieved then. Now I'm more alert now. I knew something like this would happen, but not in, on the level that we're going to get now. But I knew something was going to happen. Now I've looked at out the back of my tent, and the moon's coming straight through the trees, and it's lit up that whole bush line behind us. It's lit it up completely. Now on my phone, this is before we've got all equipment, by the way. Now on my phone, I've got like a night vision slash night cam on my phone, and I was shaking like a leaf. I'm not embarrassed to say I was petrified because. When I've had my phone through um, and the moon the moon lit up the bush completely, apart from the bottom half of it. Now, I've noticed that the whole bush line was still nothing. No weather. It's really cold. I've got Danny's fast asleep next to me, and I'm focusing on the trees behind us, and that's when I noticed what I can only describe. It was just this, another version of what I'd seen previously at the farm, but it was a completely different animal. Right, this, 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 what I seen wasn't what Danny seen. Danny seen something completely different. So there was obviously two of them. Now, what I seen was stood up on two legs. We've actually been back and measured the length of what I had seen. And I'll come to that in a minute. So straight away, I seen it. It just appeared out of nowhere. I'm not joking. What wasn't there is now there. It's just boom right in my vision i could see it as clear as daylight the moon's lit it up and there's it was i can't explain the view that i had it was unreal i had my phone i'm shaking i've got both hands and i didn't want to make a noise then all me all me fears have come in with how far are we i couldn't pinpoint this location we've got hardly no signal on the phone as the night's gone on the signals got worse it's, it was it was awful. Everything that could go wrong was going wrong. Now, I didn't want to... Danny's a lovely-hearted lad. I didn't want to introduce anything like this to him because I had no idea. I don't want to push him away as a friend. I also don't want him to experience anything like it because it can ruin you. Now, what I'm staring at is... I didn't know how tall the trees were next to it. It's got... It's, it's, it's leaning up against the tree. It's basically got its body hid behind a tree and his head's popping around. To say I'm looking, say I've got a tree in front of me, it's popping around the right side of the tree, so it's the left side to me where I'm looking at it, and it's staring, st staring straight at us. And it was exactly like one of them off the, um, the film Dog Soldiers, but it looked really, really scruffy. 
It looked really like it had been through the mill outdoors. It was it was frightening. It had a real long muzzle. It was black, long, scruffy hair. I've seen other dog men that, that are well, they look well kept, well groomed, and sort of. This one looked really scraggy, like it a long hair over its face touching its muzzle it just looked a mess to be honest with you that's the only way i can describe it as frightening as it was and it was tall it was very tall how tall um, we had to find out on a later occasion now i didn't know what to do myself so i'm stuck in this position now but danny's actually snoring his head off next to me funnily enough so i've kept this thing did not move a muscle so time's gone on. So I did not know what to do with myself. All I know is it's pitch black, left, right, in front. We can't go anyway. We've got one torch each. I mean, we're pretty ill-stocked, to be honest, for the occasion. We didn't want to venture. The one thing I didn't, what thing I had read as well, is when it's all right going off when you're startled in a group, but as soon as something, something startles you a bit more, everyone splits. And I thought, I don't want that happening. I don't want me and Danny going different ways. What can I do? So I thought I'd got to try and get a message, ring me dad up. I'm going to get me dad because I was that panicking. And the only thing I could call is the same thing as I had when I was at the farm. Should I call the police? It's the only logical thing that I could think of. So I man, I could not get a message through to my dad. Everything was being sent back to me and my heart had sunk. And every time I went back to me flapping in the tent, this thing was staring now, I've got to go back a bit, Vic, because I forgot this is something important, which I later, in me investigating what I found out was where Dogman can come from, is when I set my tent up next to this bush, because we have the fire in front of the tents, we have to make sure the bush is pushed back a bit. And as I've been pushing this bush back, I forgot to mention this, as I've been pushing this bush back, I sort of went through some soft ground with my foot. So as I've looked down and into the bush, I could see a massive hole in the ground, a hole literally going in the ground and under us. That's what it looked like. So I've said to Danny, I said, have you seen this? So all the ground near the bush was dead soft, easy to dig up, like it had been covered about several times. Now, I had no idea what this could have been, even, even to this date. I mean, we've been back twice and the hole's still there but it's got the whole the hallmarks for a den or some kind of lair. Definitely the size for it because I've I've found these lairs before. I fell on two. I might tell you in a bit, but it's exactly the same. This was covered like someone had been covering it with loads of twigs and rubbish and stuff. But as soon as I was in the bush, I could see it. So go back to where I am now. I didn't put two and two together. So I possibly could have put my stuff next to a dogman den to and that's the way we've looked at it from this moment on. Now I'm looking at this thing and this thing did not look, it had its head down like its muzzle was on its chest, if you know what I mean, if you can imagine that. Didn't have its mouth open, had its muzzle down on its chest, but it didn't take its eyes off me. It didn't move its head at all, but it had its body completely around this tree. And it all as I knew was by the, by the state of the trees and the bushes, it was tall. It was very tall taller than the one on the farm and a different kind so i've, I've met, sent about 16 messages to me dad all as i said was to me dad i says could you please i said dad don't worry i said and the only thing i think of that would get attention and help to us if i called the police that we're getting attacked by dangerous dogs that's all i could think of i couldn't word it. if i'd have said what i was seeing in a message to me dad me dad had never spoke to me again for waking him up with such a message he wouldn't have took it serious so i said we're getting attacked by dangerous dogs now where we're camping it's connected to all different types of trails and woods and forests it's next to delamere forest where we've had an encounter it's only the um, 20 minute drive away from the farm and it's right smack bang in the middle of all the trails that lead you to all the other places where like beast and castle petfit and castle Bickerton, that's got a lot of werewolf history. They're all connected. So we're in the thick of it now, basically. So I've said to me dad, I said, we're getting attacked by two dogs. That's all I could say. Two dogs off the lead. I said, they've been circling us all night, dad. I said, if you get this message, could you contact the police and say, I can't get a 999 out. Could you please 
give them our location. We've entered Nunsmere at the front gates, just up from where the hotel is. And I said, we're somewhere in the woods. I said, we're put by a water source. We're at one of the lakes. I says, could you please send the police out? I said, we're being attacked by these dogs. That's all I left my dad with a message and I left it at that. I only had, didn't have much battery left. I don't think it was when um, battery charges had the devices you could take with you. I mean, going back a few years now. So we were pretty knackered. So this had gone on all night. I know every time I went to the back of the window, Danny was fast asleep. He, as long as he was fast asleep, I didn't know his reaction. And I'm mulling over what he had said, and I'm, I'm keeping my eye on this. The moon was still lit all the bush, and I could still see it. It would, it was, it was, just didn't move, and it concentrated on gawping at us all night, staring. Not a move, not a move on it. I could clearly see its face. Now, I took pictures, pictures after picture. I've got cracking pictures. I've got pictures that I would never see the light of day for obvious reasons, and I've got pictures that I have shown. Um, I'll send you a picture after this, Vic, see what you think of it, because it's with me night vision. Now, what I've picked up on this picture is there could have been three of them, because there's when I've got home later on, if um, I may should tell you about this a bit later on, but when I've looked at the pictures later on, like the day after, there's a third one, which is between the two, one where Danny seen, and that, the one that Danny seen was on the left side of the bush at the very end, so you go 10 yards to the right and that's where the one I've seen stood behind the tree. Now, in between that, there's a third one. So they're like in fighter formation, if you could say that. One, like the way they, the way they were positioned, it was quite airy. Then again, that was a different animal altogether. Um, the picture that I've got of that, it's mouth gaping wide open, staring straight at us. And when I'm saying gaping wide open, its mouth is wide open. Uh, it wasn't snarling or making any nasty noises. It was it just a gaping mouth, as all I can say. And it was massive, gigantic. Just that's the picture that I've got. But we didn't know this until the day after. So later on, my phone's picked some signal up at some point. I've not moved a muscle. And I've couldn't, it's got through to my dad at some point early. I was in the morning. My dad immediately, because my dad understands, he's contacted the police now, the police have got a small whereabouts, but they were unwilling to come for us until the early hours of the morning because of the daylight. But they've got, they've set off. So the police have hit the woods somewhere around 5 a.m. Now, even at 5 a.m., this thing was still perched on by that tree. I didn't take my eyes off it. I could hardly move. I was still, I never got the horrific feelings that I got from the dog man before that. I could, but I was feeling sick as a dog. I felt weak. Uh, if I'd have put two and two together with this hole in the bush next to me tent, I'd have been freaked out even more because that's just unlucky. <laughs> so it's still dark and it's going to start getting light about six, half six. So as light's going to start approaching, it's still pitch black. And I've got my eyes on this. So I thought if I'm going to do anything, I'm going to see it get off. I'm going to see it move. As I'm sat on my hands, I couldn't record it anymore because I was absolutely freezing and I was shaking. It was just pointless. So I've got my eyes focused on it and I could hear dogs barking in the distance. And that was obviously the police coming to us. So, and I could hear whistles being blown. So my heart, I've woke Danny up. I haven't told Danny that the police are coming. I've just said to Danny, I've woke, tried to wake him up because I couldn't wake him up. I wasn't going to get out of the tent. So it took me about 10, 15 minutes to get his attention. I said, we've got to get up, Danny. He said, he said we've got to go. I said, I'll explain in a bit. So he's if in an orange. So Danny slowly starts getting up. Um, light's starting to come through behind us. And as I've looked over to the tree, it completely vanished, gone. And I'd been watching this thing now all night, watching it, waiting for this opportunity. And it's disappeared, gone, like a flash. The whole thing where I was looking is now I can see through it. I can see the trees behind. But it was quite frightening. And so we've sat there. So I've got out the tent then. I've got Danny out the tent. And I've said to myself that I've got to be honest with Danny now. I'm going to have to tell him about the farm. I'm going to have to have a good chat with him, a good sit down, a good chat, and tell him actually what's out there because we need to make a decision on this. Because this, I don't know whether this is pure luck or whether it's something to do with me or what. This is like two times now on the trot. So I don't know what's happening, but I seem to be attracting these things. And this wasn't, this seemed to happen. 
more or less every time I went out from the farm, every single time I went out, um, at some point something would happen. So the police have turned up. We could hear him. I've had, me and Danny have took a slow walk and we've ended up getting right right round the other side of the lake as the lights started to come in pretty rapid and we could hear them. There were six of them and we were pleased to meet them. And, that, and we just left it at that. We just said, now Danny still thinks that it's a dangerous dog off the lead. It's not, obviously. So as we said to the police, not, and they were really welcome and gave us a cup of tea and everything. And we were fine from then on, and we got all the stuff. They came back with us, helped us get stuff together. And we were going on about, and this is where I started to Google a lot of the cattle that had been attacked. And this is this is where, what opened that door, because the copper was saying, oh, we have lots of trouble with um, animals getting attacked on farms. So I was intrigued by this, and I asked him, not at that moment, because it was still in a bit of a mess, but I asked the same officer just before we left when we were getting in the car, what do you mean? What animals? He said, oh, we've had cows with the underbellies ripped off. Some things like pulling the others completely off the animal and letting the cows bleeding out, sheep that are getting the throats ripped out and all sorts. And the, it's all getting blamed on dangerous dogs off the lead, particular types. Although no particular dog has been caught for the offence itself, that's where the fingers are getting pointed. Now, that's when I started to think something else. You know, it's, this is where my studying started to go. So um, we got to the road and we, um, I said to Danny, I said, me and you were going to have to have a chat. I said, um, we can bring me dad now. So my dad picked us up. He got his taxi to pick him up. Danny had gone home. I had gone home. I was nowhere near as in a mess like I was last time because I didn't have that thing that hit me in the chest. But I was still in a mess. And I thought, here we go. Why has this happened again? I felt unlucky, but fortunate for some reason because I'm back home. It's something wasn't, I needed to find out a bit more about this. All I know is I needed to make a decision. What I want to do with this, do I turn this into a, some type of work and start getting stuck in and start revising, start really, because I am curious now. And I'm not joking. This is like on my doorstep. I don't know what, why this part of my life has introduced this thing to me. I've got ideas, but, I, you know, I don't know. Um, I said to Danny, I'm going to come over to yours the day after. I want a good chat with you. So I arranged to see Danny the day after. Oh, I've met up with Danny. I think we met on bikes. I'm not too sure. We went out on a bike ride and um, sat down. And I told him all about the farm. I said to him, I told him about Nuns Mia, says, and that's why I got him in the tent quick. I don't think he was too happy with me calling the night because he was in a bit of a mood to do it when I put him in the tent early, but now he understands. And oh, thank God he was fascinated, absolutely fascinated with what I told him. And from that moment on, we partnered up and um, we turned it into a bit of a part of our lives. Danny's thriving with what he does and me the same. And I do my thing, he does his. And that's how it's been from the non -Vic. Danny has got a lot to talk about and I really wish you'd come on your show and talk to you because he does um, a lot around the local areas around where he lives and by the farm area where I first seen the dogmen. But um, he's got lots to tell Danny. The next time we went out, me and Danny, now we're both into it and all we're doing is when we're going out now is we get more tackle together. We put your show on just to get us in the mood. Give you know the more shows we listen to, the more we're aware of, and that's how it's been from then on, mate. Yeah, see, talking about it now doesn't do it justice. Waiting for the police to come was the worst feeling ever. All as I know is when I got that message to me dad, my phone would hardly work. I've got this message to me dad, and I knew when it said received, I knew me dad would have called the police. So I had a great relief. Now, how the police got to us, they were hours after I sent the SOS out, but they did come. And funnily enough, they were well up for it as well. So they completely understood. But um, I was having them out there for other things. It was horrific. But on the last show, I described it so well, but I've gone the other way this time. But, but the, what, what I want people to know is the difference on... When they hit you with that bolt of infrasound, whatever they call it, whatever it is they do to you, I've had it happen again, um, which I will tell you about if you want me to, uh, the one in Yorkshire, exactly the same. There's a big difference on how you deal with the night, I'm telling you. And I didn't have that happen this time. This was more of a creepier 
approach to us. It was more of a, I don't know, it was like they wanted. Now, the more I think about it, I could have been camping right next to their home. But something said to me, they would try and get closer to us without us seeing them, if you know what I mean. That's the impression I got. But there was three different dogmen on that night. But from then on, me and Danny said to ourselves, right, you know what? We're going to start studying and we're going to go out there now and we're going to do our job and we're going to uncover this. This is on our doorstep. We don't know one person who's into what we're into. And me and Danny, we're like brothers we are. We've, it's anything that we are interested in, we do it together and, and we do it well. So from that moment on, we didn't want to take it too serious because it scared us off. So we, we were sort of doing it from distance, if, if that makes any sense. And people go on about, why don't you pull a camera out? Why don't this? I can't answer for many people, but I tell you, I have been 20 foot away from that animal and I took over 100 pictures. And if you think my hand was still at any of them moments, you must be joking. I was shaking. It was like I'd been hit by a bolt of lightning. And I'm shaking and I'm trying to get me pictures. And I'm not trying to give myself any excuses. It's impossible. But I had the opportunity, and the first few pictures I got were corkers as far as I was concerned. But bearing in mind, it, it, I didn't have a really good phone. It's like when I go out now, I mean, for this Christmas, I've got some cracking technology now. I've bought a night vision and all. You can alter it for any weather, whether it's stormy, dark, pitch black, foggy, you name it. These lenses sort it out, and I can plug my phone into this device so I don't have to touch it. So that's going to bring out some good pictures this year. So what I'll do now is I'm going to jump ahead possibly five years now. I'm going five years because I want to tell you about this one because it has a connection with the farm incident. Now, this, this is for anybody who lives in Yorkshire because I know Yorkshire is absolutely riddled in dogman, especially along the coast. Now, I have quite a few friends that um, live in different areas. Now, on this particular occasion, my friend and his girlfriend, the, his girlfriend basically had gone gone through a bit of a bad divorce and she'd met my friend and they wanted to move away. Now, they've chosen the village in Yorkshire. So they've moved out of Cheshire to Yorkshire and they've settled in a place called Loftus. It's a village right next to the coast. It's got a lot of history and all this stuff. It's at the top of Yorkshire. And funnily enough, it's right next to the moors. And they were renting a cottage out. Now, my mate Damon, he's been there for quite some time now. And um, he knows what I'm into. He knows me hobby and all this. And he's called me up this one day. And he says, Dave, he said, you're going to have to get up here. I says, why? What's happened? He says, I've been talking to a farmer. Now, across from his house is a farm. And his farmland stretches right out fields after fields. And then it hits the coast. Now, what Damon didn't tell me was the cottage he was renting out at the back of his house it actually takes, it's a five minute walk and then you're actually on the moors itself, Yorkshire moors. That's one of the biggest hotspots for werewolf sightings in the UK as far as I'm concerned. It's riddled. So I've said to Damon, what's going on? So when did you find out that something's going on there? He said, only today. He's been talking to a farmer across the way and um, Damon's interested in the supernatural and all this stuff. And um, all along this road, there's a, like an old, cottages and along this lane really old lane and there's a farm and um, he's been asking there was a story that his neighbor said they keep seeing this massive black animal every now and again standing right at the end of the lane and it disappears into fields so he's been asking when damon speaks to people he starts striking the conversation up getting more information and then he was going to gather enough and then tell me and invite me up but this day he's been speaking to this farmer for the first time and the farmer said he says, always oh, I've been having lots of trouble. He says, his sheep are getting attacked all the time. He said, they're going missing. Because um, what started this conversation was this farmer, he's had a shed broken into and some of his equipment was nicked and some of his bicycles had gone. So he stopped Damon. He's noticed Damon lives on the end of the row. And he said to Damon, bit of a warning for you, I've had my shed broken into. And that's how the conversation struck. So at the end of this conversation, he says, oh, by the way, he says, it's not only me bicycles and uh, some farm equipment that have been nicked i've had sheep gone missing and that's how that's come about he said he's had sheep dying just out the blue he says he's had sheep that have been attacked by animals so damon's took all this info on in the sheep that have gone missing and he's run me up 
So I said, right, I'm coming up. So I've got my stuff together. It didn't take me long to get packed. I was up on the train, straight through to Yorkshire, got to Lock, got to Middlesbrough. We got a um, taxi over to Loftus. Very quiet, eerie village it is. Got to Damon's. Damon's got a massive field at the back of his house and a farm and another farm. And then it hits the road, a couple of fields, and then the Yorkshire Moors is right there. So this farm in front of it, there's like a lane that cuts through the middle of it. It goes, I'd say, 400 yards down on a steep embankment. It goes right down to the seaside itself. So what we said was, Damon told me all the ifs and the story about it, what the farmer said. I didn't really need to know much, right? So I had, had my phone and everything, I had a camera. Um, I was going to go down. And what the plan, I was there for a few days and I was going to set up shop. And um, we were going to go out for a walk at night. So we about half past 11, midnight come, and we start went for a walk down the lane. Now, we've gone down for walk. There's animals either side of us. Now, we've got halfway down the lane, and I got hit in the face with this ungodly smell of urine. And I'm not joking. It was the most disgusting smell I've ever smelt in my life. Absolutely. I had to peg my nose and shut my mouth. You couldn't breathe. It was that. And it come out the blue. Straight away, I knew what it was. I wasn't going to muck about. Now, I said to Damon, and I'm not going to get into conversation with Damon. I says, you know what? I says, I think we should turn back. Then he looked a bit sheepish himself, like he was on something. He says, yeah, come on then. He says, I think we should. He goes, we can always come tomorrow. So he's like sprinting ahead of me, walking fast. And he's a big lad. He's like 6'5". And he's ahead of me. Now, I can't get a full breath. Every time I took a breath in, it was stinging my nose. So I mean, I'm not joking, it stunk. I've smelt this smell a few times, right? Right at the wrong time and the wrong place. So as we've got to the top of the road, I've got into Damon's, and the more I, we were getting closer to Damon's, I had this really, really eager urge to sprint. So I've caught up to Damon, and I've gone, I didn't feel right down there. He says, no, I didn't. He says, I just felt, I felt sick. I said, did you smell that? He didn't even notice the smell. He said he just felt sick as a dog. So we've got into his house, sat in the front room. Now. This is the worst bit because we sat down with the curtains open and I was so intrigued. I wanted to get out there, but I knew it was time to get indoors. I wanted to investigate, but I've got to do it from Damon's cottage. So I said, do you mind if I stay downstairs? And he says, no, mate. He said, look, he said, I'm not feeling too well. He says, I've got an awful stomach. He says, I'm going to go upstairs. He said, do you mind? I said, no, mate. I said, I'll just chill out down here, make a cup of hot chocolate. So Damon's gone to bed. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, right? And I was sat down in the front room. Now I'm sat down looking at the hedgerow across. Now, I've never told anyone this. This is the first, I don't even think I've told Damon. I'm sat down and all I heard was this massive blast. The only way I could describe it was something has just ran past the house at such a speed. It's left a, like a, a smacking noise on anything that rattled outside the house. That's all I can describe it. If there was anything loose on the house, like objects, like butterflies, you know, the hanging butterflies or the hanging baskets, whatever has gone past has not them with its blast. It just boom, straight past. And the noise it made, it was like a sonic boom type. That's all I can describe it. It was boom, boom, and it shot past. And I'm not joking. All the chimes were going ding, ding, ding outside. The baskets were, whatever had gone past was massive. So, and that's gone and shot down the lane. So that straight away, I'm thinking that it was no vehicle, put it that way. And whatever it was, was on the road. I wish I could do it justice, Vic. I wish I could get that noise that it made. But can you imagine an object, a large object that is going at such a speed, it rattles everything round you. Like, boom, sit and it take your breath away if you were outside. Boom, and you wouldn't be able to see it. It would be such a blur. Boom. That's what it was, like a bullet, and he's gone past. Anyway, so I was more intrigued now, and I'm, I'm sort of stood up, and I, I've gone to check the front door. I've locked the front door, but to check the front door was locked, locked it, made sure it was locked again, shut the other door. I've gone into the front room. I've looked to the right. The hedge is flat, about, and it's, six, say, say, six foot high. So I've got a gap of 15 to 20 yards. And then I've got the hedge and then the farmer's grounds and the fields and path that we had just come up. So this hedge is like six foot high. 
So I've had a look. I've had a look up and down. Such an eerie place. I've turned around. Can't remember what I was doing, but I've done something. Uh, whether I went in the kitchen or not, checked the back door. I can't remember. Then I've come back in the front room and I've gone back in the front room and I've looked at the hedge again and I've noticed to me right, the hedge has got a lump in it, a lump in it on, on the right-hand side, just by the gate. So and I've had a closer look, and Vic, I'm not joking, it was, I, I straight away I knew what type of dog man it was, and I knew. And I've got to get this description right because it need to know because this is a cloaking device in its element. So whatever it was, when I first glanced over, it didn't take me long before I found out what actually dog man it was. It was just at its head over the hedge staring straight at me again like the farm i didn't it, it was only when i clocked the facial features and the moment i realized what it was i was hit with that same thing again that hit me on the farm it was like a bolt of lightning straight in the chest straight in my heart wallop and it smacked me i looked at its face and it's and, and it's so creepy its face was made, it looked like it was made of leaves. I could see its eyes, I could see its snout, and it could see its eyes, and it looked evil. And it was the hyena-type dog man, if you've ever seen. But the moment I clapped its eyes, exactly like the dog man on the farm, the moment my eyes met its eyes, and it was staring straight at me. So it's obviously caught on to us on that walk, and then it's followed us back to Damon's. And it's been perched outside watching us. That's how it was. And it was staring straight at me. I was hitting the chest. Straight away, I was back to square one. This hasn't happened since the farm. Straight away, I was pushed back. I hit the banister. I was curled over, like in a fetal position, but stood up. And I couldn't straighten myself up. My heart was going... <laughs> I could hear the... <laughs> no, I'm not joking. That's what my heart sounded like. <laughs> I could hear squelching in my chest. It was tightening up the valves, the, the squelch. It was, it was horrific. But that was a cracking example, by the way. And I've hit the floor, sort of on my back now, and I'm just praying to God I don't have a heart attack again. I can't believe. And I never all my fears come. Like, why am I doing this? Why am I here? After the first encounter I had, why am I doing this to myself? All your negatives come up. Everything you ignore. And I'm on the floor in the same position. And I'm thinking, I ain't going to make this. This is horrendous. This has got me. And all my legs were going into such a state of panic. All my fingers and my, my, my legs started to like con contort, sort of bend and like snap. It's like you imagine the worst panic attack a person could have where your body just starts to fold in. It was like that, but with the feeling I was having a heart attack. And all I wanted to do was stand up. And I was I wanted to get upstairs then the day because I thought that thing outside was one of the evilest things that I've ever clapped eyes on in my life. If you go on about the incident in the farm, that the way that one looked and the way that was looking at me, this is nothing. This is well worse. This is the worst. The evil look it and its eyes and it they, they were slack. I could see its eyeballs and it was slightly shut. But it actually it blended itself in with the bush. Whatever the bush in front of it, it was actually exactly like that. So this morphing technique that they have. So it's like if I if it was standing next to um, a shed, a shed, a normal shed, it would actually look like it's part of the shed. But you'd be able to see its features. And I could see its features. I could see its eyes. And I could see it staring straight at me. And I was on my back after that, Vic. And I'm not joking, I was there for about an hour and a half and I didn't move. And even when I got me, me functions back, I, I mean, I've been there before and I just reckon if I was in an ill, in a, in an Ill state or I, I was in, in some way, um, in some kind of um, poorly state, I don't know what, but I know that if I gave it another inch, I don't think I'd have managed to stop myself from having a full-on heart attack or seizure or some, some kind of horrific thing to me body because uh, i was i was counting me i was saying goodbye to me family as as i was on that floor as my arms started to curl up never experienced this on the first time but my hands were basically snapping they were folding back on me it was apparently it's it, it's severe
panic attack as well. Um, it's what happens in severe panic attack. But oh god, I was in a mess. And um, so as the mornings come, same again. I've not told Damon because these are things you can't really express to anybody. And I didn't want to really rock me boat because I just got whatever whatever it's done to me. It's hit me nervous system, and my nervous system is. I'm not joking. If it took another knock, it's going to shut me down. I would have complete and utter shutdown. My body wouldn't be able to handle it. And they're joking whether it would be a noise. Even if someone helped me up, I reckon that would be enough to finish me off. I just had to stay in this fetal position and the, that my body's put me in for survival. That's all I can say. It was like a survival position. Oh, it's horrific. So as the mornings come, I slab, I've... I've got the, the curtains were open as well. And I, I, after hearing the thing, and, and then I put two and two together, I knew whatever it was had ran past earlier on, boom, straight past the house. And whatever it was was that big, it made enough wind, enough pressure as it was steaming through through the village. It's gone and knocked all the dangly things outside, the charms and stuff, everything. And it went brrr, ding, dinging and oh, it's so creepy. It was it was eerie, so eerie. So at the mornings come, I'd already packed my bags. I thought I'm into the subject, but I'm not into it that much. I'm packing my bags and I'm going home. It's all right looking for these things and being into it, but say I have a method and the way I go about it. I'm not a person that sort of the boots on the ground and they'll go deep into woods. I'm not, especially at night. I'm not like that. What I do is the way I go about things is in which I do things better now is. I'll find a location or I'll speak to somebody or I'll get knowledge of where this the werewolf sightings or dogman sightings are. And then I'll locate a bed and breakfast or a hotel, hopefully right on the land where this beast has been seen. And then I'll organize a weekend in the hotel and I'll set up like a surveillance post in the bedroom. I'll always get the rooms facing the fields. I'll go out in the day and I'll have a walk. And I, but at night time, I'm set up for that area all around there. And then fingers crossed, you know that's how that's how I do things anyway. But it very rarely that I'll branch out, especially as night time falls, because every single time I have gone out, something's come to me. And I always put that down to the it's switched on. They know who and what you are, because whatever it was, I smelt it halfway down that field, and it was disgusting. I've smelt that smell up quite a few times before. The urine smell is so potent and it's mixed in with a, a sickly... I've, I've smelt the same smell when I got some reports off a friend and there's a place near Windsor. This is not too long after the farm and after the encounter where we call the police. I made a lot of friends and I found out there was a lot of female dogman sightings outside of Winsford, about half an hour away at, um, near a motorway. The female dogman's been seen jumping in and out of traffic and jumping over hedges. So I've put what I've learned together and I found out that it's quite common that the long stretches of motorway and dual carriageways, these animals are seen. Now, on this particular part of the M6, I got a bit cocky. So I booked into a hotel down the road. I booked in there and I got itchy feet and I thought I'd go for a walk. So I got me sat now on my phone and I thought, so what I'm going to do is. I still do it every now and again. I'll cut through all the fields. I'll go the way as if I wanted to be an animal that was trying to avoid the public. Which ways would I go? So I tried to make my own pathways and I was crossing over fields after fields. Stupidly, I hadn't took too much notice of the time. Time was sort of closing in on me. Now, I've got like an hour and a half before night sets in and it sets in pretty rapid. I was enjoying myself too much. I hadn't found anything at this point, but I've gone off track and I've took a wrong turning. When I have decided to come home, I've took a wrong turning and I knew that straight away because I wasn't seeing any of the signs that I'd seen on the way in. And I've gone, so there's an embankment and I've tried to be smart and get a shortcut. The motorway is right next to me. And I've gone down an embankment and I've sort of lost my footing. I've skidded down this embankment into, into what I can only describe as a swampy area. I don't know where the fluid comes from to make these places. It's that putrid. You'd find pigs would be happy in there, just about. And I've sort of skidded to the bottom. And as I've got to the bottom, I've smelt that smell of dog urine at the same time. 
So and I've put my foot in this swamp and then I've turned around and looked behind me and I've seen two massive holes that were burrowed into the ground. And it looks to me like something had made the like a, a badger had made these holes, then something's overtook this as a home, made it a lot more adaptable for them. So basically what was for something, it isn't now, it's for something else. And it's, the, the hole was massive. There's like a walkway into it as far as I was concerned. And there's two of them right next to each other. And they stunk, absolute stunk of dog urine. They, it was most disgusting. And the feeling of death that I got when I hit the floor there was, oh, it was something else. I've got myself together and I couldn't get up the embankment. I've noticed as I was climbing up the embankment, all the trees around me, every single one of them was clawed, scratch marked. And I'm not joking hand on heart, this is genuine. They had all been torn chunks out of. Now, I've seen this before. Um, it looks like something's been sharpening its nails on the trunks. That's the only way I can describe it. And it's right next to where these holes were, right next to this swampy, putrid. The, the, the only man-made thing I could see was a barrel, a blue barrel that was in. The, it's only a small swamp, I'd say about, about a large swimming pool. But it was old. You could tell it's been there for years and years. And these two holes were right next to it, but in the embankment, not going underground. They were in the embankment. Now, as I've, as I've tried to climb, I've had a look, but I knew what I just fell into. I'm trying to climb back up where I'd just come from. And as I've been climbing up, I've noticed all the trees were damaged on my left, on my right. They were all pulled apart. All the branches were off. All the scrap marks on the I've seen them many a times. I managed to get to the top, and then I thought to myself, it is getting dark as well, and I, I'm like an hour away from where I'm staying, and it's all fields. I need to get to a road. I've got my phone soaking wet. I couldn't get that working properly, so I've just started to belt it across this field, just hoping that I could see what some farmland or something I can just jump on. The motorway's to me right, but there's a massive fence so this place is right next to the motorway. If you were to pull over on the motorway, you go up the embankment, it's just there, right in plain view. And I've heard that quite a lot as well about their dogman. Uh, people have seen dogman just hopping over the fences. I mean, they live you know, uh, right in front of you in plain sight, places that you wouldn't ever go, like, just like this one. And um, I've never, ever, ever gone. Tell a lie, I did go back in car on the outskirts, but I've never gone back to that place. But I had an awful feeling that said to me, if I don't get out of there now quick and I'm counting on that I'm, I'm fit and healthy enough because my legs have gone to jelly and I know that smell of dog urine by our, it's the worst type of smell. You can't breathe. It's that disgusting. And it's mixed in with the surroundings, which is that putrid smell. Now, if I go back to the Yorkshire story where I smelt the, the urine, Damon felt sick because of the putrid, swampy smell that he could pick up. I couldn't smell that. I could just smell the dog urine. He said as he's gone down, he thought it was um, something to do with the cows. He says, but as he's got down, every breath he's took of this, this horrible smell, and that's exactly what I was smelling now. It's like a dirty, swampy where they live. That's, that's all I can describe it as, but that was pretty horrific, Vic. Yeah. Oh, God, it was awful, it was. If you've had a Dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know.